Hi, welcome back to Reading for Pleasure as I continue reading my story, The Titanic by Ellen Emerson White. We are up to Friday, the 12th of April, 1912. RMS Titanic, somewhere at sea. I have now discovered that when one is aboard a ship, there is a whole new vocabulary to learn. I got Robert to explain some of it to me this morning when he arrived with tea, toast and jam. Port is left and starboard is right, I think. It's hard to keep all these new words straight in my mind. The bow is the front of the ship and the stern is the rear. When people say amidships, they mean to say the middle. Aft is somewhere behind you. Corridors are alleyways. The kitchen is a galley and walls are bulkheads. And never, ever, ever would you call the Titanic a boat. She's a ship. Why ships are called she rather than he has not yet been satisfactorily explained to me. Tradition, perhaps. Mrs Carstairs has found a group of avid bridge players and they spent most of the day playing in the lounge. I watched for a while but found the intricacies of the game quite dreary. With Mrs Carstairs occupied, I had plenty of time to explore today. Her only firm request is that I be certain to come to her stateroom before meals to help her dress. That sounds foolish, but with all her corsets and petticoats and elaborate dresses, she seems to need an extra pair of hands. She changes before every single meal, and I've yet to see her wear the same outfit twice. This variety seems to be very important to the women on the ship, although, for the life of me, I'm not sure why. It seems a great waste of time to worry so about fashion. I even grow impatient during the time it takes to comb my hair. Mrs Carstairs is disturbed that a young man is serving as our cabin steward and says she is tempted to request a stewardess instead. I quickly promise that she could depend on me to assist in any way she desires and remind her of the lovely job Robert had done arranging her flowers. She seemed dubious, but finally nodded reluctantly and waved me away. I went all the way down, G deck, F deck, I've lost count, to the swimming pool and squash court this morning and peeked inside the rooms. I had no urge in either of these activities, uh, to engage in either of these activities, but it was entertaining to watch the others do so. I examined the Turkish baths, the post office, the first class maids and valets dining saloon. I've not run across many of the maids and valets and rarely even see the young woman who shares my lavatory. Her name is Josephine and her employer is a crotchety and demanding elderly woman who keeps her so busy she scarcely has a moment to herself. I am fortunate that Mrs Carstairs is far more reasonable about such things. We are, perhaps, not an ideal pair, but even my brief glimpses of Josephine's harried face rushing by makes me count my blessings. For amusement, I rode in the lifts for a while and had a nice chat with a boy named Stephen who operates one of them. He's from Southampton and is overjoyed to have found employment on such a fine ship. It is funny. I'm only really comfortable here when I'm speaking to members of the crew. I'm sure I would feel at ease if I were travelling in steerage, since I would no longer feel like such a fraud. I know how lucky I am, but still... It wouldn't have been nice if I'd earned my passage on this ship. Later on, I wandered into the gymnasium and the very fit Mr Macaulay, who oversees the room, demonstrated the various machines for me. In the East End, people are too busy working to exercise, but it seems to be different for the leisured classes. I did not care for the mechanical horse or camel, far too jouncy and erratic, but I pedalled quite effectively on a stationary bicycle. It is strange to ride and ride and not go anywhere, but there is a clock on the wall with small pointers that move to show how far you've travelled. I also tried the rowing machine, but did not find myself to be very adept at this. First class passengers can go anywhere they choose, but the second class, and most especially the third class passengers, are restricted to certain parts of the ship. There are actually locked gates and other barriers to keep the steerage passengers segregated from everyone else. The only time I've seen anyone from steerage is at the end of the promenade, looking down at the deck by the ship's stern. That particular deck is known, here I shall share some more of my new vernacular, courtesy of Robert, as the poop deck. There is almost always a great laughing crowd gathered there, and some man keeps playing the bagpipes. I've also heard a fiddler. It reminds me fondly of Whitechapel. First class passengers tend to frown down at the steerage passengers, pointing and making comments as if there were zoological gardens in Regent's Park. This makes me so uncomfortable, I've decided I will stay to the bow end of the ship as much as possible. 
I have no sense of what the conditions are like down in steerage, and I hope it's not too dreadful. William's stories of his transatlantic voyage were horrid and haunting. I have little sense of what's happening anywhere other than the first-class areas. Part of me would like to go down and see steerage for myself, but the idea of being able to pass through the lock gates at will, while others cannot, is terribly offensive to me. I think it would be very contemptuous in the lift. In the lift, Stephen told me that a number of first-class passengers have done just that, laughing when they returned and talking about how fun it was to go slumming. So, despite my curiosity, I have no intention of doing that myself. The ship is so big that you can actually get tired walking around it. When I bring Florence, I always have to carry her part of the way. She can be fierce, but she's not very hardy because it's so uh, because it's so cold. Mrs Carstairs has been making me put a tiny handmade sweater on Florence before taking her out. It seems whimsical to me, but I'm not about to argue. Besides, Florence enjoys preening. <clears throat> On more than one occasion, I have passed a remarkably tall, moustached man walking his Airedale on the boat deck. He's been pointed out to me as Colonel Astor, and Mrs Carstairs says that he's one of the richest men in the entire world. He never seems to look cheerful, except when he's walking his dog. People are always gossiping about his wife because she's much younger than he is, and in the family way. There is much gossip during meals about everyone and everything, and I'm very glad to be such an anonymous figure. Once people find out that I'm only a companion, most of them promptly lose interest in me and begin to talk to someone else. I'm not easily offended, so this bothers me not a whit. Besides, the marvellous meals themselves continue to offer me plenty of distraction. A man named Mr Hollings has attached himself to us because we're unescorted. Apparently, gentlemen aboard the ship feel a duty to look after women travelling alone. Mrs Carstairs says her Frederick would be pleased to know that we're so well protected. His guardianship seems mostly demonstrated by his taking Mrs Carstairs by one elbow and leading us to our table at mealtimes. If Mrs Carstairs is out on the deck, a fairly rare event, as she continues to be occupied by a marathon of card games, Mr Hollings makes certain that the ever-responsive stewards are paying her what he feels is, a, is sufficient attention. Often now, during meals, he joins us, along with a rather weedy young man named Ralph Kittery, whose sole pursuits appear to be polo and the American stock market. Mrs Carstairs is much better about feigning interest in these subjects than I am. I can manage nothing better than a vague impersonal smile and maybe a nod or two. What an unusual situation to be seated at tables full of Americans meal after meal. They are lively people, but almost childishly gullible. Any Englishman or woman would instantly see through my accent, which is, at best, of the light Oxford variety. I've been introduced to some of the British passengers in the reception room before dinner and so forth, and once I speak they almost always give me a smile that looks like a wry wink. But the Americans all seem to think I sound terribly clever. When I do speak, Mrs Carstairs appears to hold her breath. I'm not exactly sure what she fears I'll say, but it seems as good a reason as any to remain reserved. A Mrs Jansen from Philadelphia was included in our dinner group this evening. She's blonde and willowy and prone to blinking constantly. When I asked her where I, when she asked where I was from, and when I said Whitechapel by way of Wapping, she commented on the beauty of the names. Insofar as Whitechapel is concerned, I wanted to say that yes, Jack the Ripper had apparently shared her affectation for this area, but held my tongue. Rarely do these Americans seem to enjoy my humour, but sometimes I admit I cannot resist. I met the most remarkable Parisian child on the boat deck today, I remarked, during a lull in the conversation tonight. Scarcely four years old and already speaking French. A puzzled silence fell over the table. Then, to my surprise, Horace, the wine steward, laughed. He was not joined by anyone else, quickly changed the laugh into a cough <coughs> and began to fill everyone's glasses. In the meantime, I returned to my haddock. And soon the conversation shifted, once again, to the many joys of the summer season in Newport. Such are the social interactions I've been experiencing. I must be a terrible disappointment as a companion, since Mrs Carstairs and I are able to find little common conversational ground. But I'm continuing to assume a number of mundane housekeeping chores for her, so I guess I'm fulfilling the requirements of a maid. 
These tasks include sending her clothes out daily to be sponged and pressed, changing the water in her flower vases, ordering trays for her, and of course, taking very good care of Florence. Devoted as Mrs Carstairs is to her dog, she does not seem to enjoy walking her, or more crucially, cleaning up after her. Yesterday, Florence caught me off guard right at the end of a row of covered lifeboats, and a passing ship's officer gallantly contributed his handkerchief to the cause. I was happy to, to, I was happy to retire somewhat earlier than usual tonight. My day of exploring fatigued me. The sound of those steadily throbbing engines below is very soothing and also helps lull one to sleep. With all the many sights on the ship, I still think that I like the reading and writing room best of all. I could easily spend the full day there and never grow restless. Between that room and the library, I would have no trouble finding activities to amuse myself. The weather was so lovely today. I hope tomorrow is just as nice. And that brings us tomorrow to Saturday the 13th of April 1912 getting closer and closer to disaster goodbye <laughs>